Hello, welcome everybody. We're really pleased today to have David Eisenhower here to talk about his work and process in making his beautiful cast metal sculptures uh, with a focus on natural materials, in particular seeds of various types in this show. I'm gonna turn it over to David. And Thank we're you. We're so happy to have you. I'm so happy to be here. I think this is a great opportunity, a, a beautiful space, and wonderful nonprofit that's been here for 75 years now. Um, I feel really honored. So I, I'd like to just start with a little bit about um, like my history, my career, and how I ended up doing bronze sculpture in particular. I was born in northern Pennsylvania, uh, in uh, Middletown, Pennsylvania, little burb of Harrisburg. Um, and uh, then I, pretty much the slums, very, very poor. And then moved to the pretty much the slums of Scranton, Pennsylvania. And uh, then my father <coughs> moved with me to northern Pennsylvania to a little town called Elk Lake. Very small school, um, not much of an arts program at all. And I was already starting to be interested in the arts. Black and white photography was what I loved at 10 years old. Ansel Adams was my hero. Um, and uh, I kind of would just study the night before and then get a C on every test and we were really poor and so not much of an opportunity for college. Um, so I actually looked at the military and decided I would do that and then possibly use that to go into college afterwards. So I entered the military and I could choose at that time, there was no wars going on or anything, where I wanted to be stationed first, I chose Schwabach, Germany, because they had a dark room where the military press would do their photographs. So I got stationed there for two years. I really started working on my photography as well as exploring uh, Germany because I was a, uh, spec four really fast and that meant that I could go off base every night if I wanted to and on the weekends I could travel. So I did. Uh, I, ex I explored Europe. I took um, complementary courses from the University of Maryland on uh, European history and things like that and I developed black and white film, thousands and thousands of reels of it of my own. Um, from there when I got out I ended up in stationed in Newport News, and I ended up then moving to the eastern shore of Virginia, where I, or the Del Marvelous Peninsula, as they called it, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, uh, the Chesapeake Bay, the Assateague Wild Ponies, and you know, the wildlife there definitely had a big, big influence on me. I started painting there in watercolors and was showing at a couple of small little galleries locally, very touristy galleries. I came across the small foundry by William Turner, not the famous painter, a different one, a sculptor, although he did end up with a piece in the White House at the time. Um, and I, learned, I approached the place and with my paintings and said I could TIG weld really well, and they hired me, and, and I was, in, within two years, the lead artisan there and in charge of every piece of artwork that went through it. Um, I, basically just got really bored with the place at some point and um, was invited by a relative to come explore the Pacific Northwest. So in 1992, I moved out here to um, Chimicum, Washington. I live in Port Hadlock now, it's a stone's throw away. And I started working at River Dog Fine Arts Foundry. And at River Dog, it was just a wonderful small foundry that was just immersed in the, um, some of the old masters of the Pacific Northwest. Um, I have a little list here because my memory sometimes isn't great. Tony Angel, John Hoover, Tom Jay, Philip Levine, who they just showed here recently, Philip McCracken, Ann Morris, Mary Ranlett would come by and do photographs constantly. Um, Philip McCracken, um, really appreciated my own artwork, and I ended up doing all the finish work on, on his pieces. Um, so after about, I'd say, 92 till 2000, um, I worked there steadily, and then it was part-time, and in 2003, 
I went full time to working on my sculpture. Um, and since then, um, I've been involved in a lot of shows around the country. And I'll take the advantage of using my notes again for this one. So going, I think, kind of in the order somewhat, Sculpture in the Park in Loveland, Colorado, the Polk Museum of Art in Florida, the Mary Hill Museum of Wa Art in Washington, New Hope Sculpture Exhibit in Pennsylvania, new works of naturalism in the Gerald Peters Gallery in Santa Fe, one of the bigger, older galleries there, the Bellevue Sculpture Exhibit multiple times, Flora, which I was proud of, um, and kind of fits into this show a little bit, because um, I was actually still, I was already doing some of my seed pieces then, at the U.S. Botanical Gardens in Washington, D.C., the Chautauqua Annual Exhibit of Fine Art in New York. There's kind of a fun story about that one. So we arrive at the Chautauqua Exhibit, which is like an exhibit of all kinds of arts. And my wife and I, Heidi, arrived there um, a day early, and they were getting our room ready, and they said, you have one of the bigger ones because you're a couple, and we're just uh, cleaning up because Yo-Yo Ma just left the room. And I said to Heidi, so now we can say we slept in the same bed with Yo-Yo Ma. <laughs> so some of the other ones would be, uh, for a while I was represented by the Denise Bibro Gallery in New York City. Um, I did then here locally um, neo-naturalist group. I kind of put together a group of artists and we showed at COCA, uh, Center on Contemporary Art, some years ago. That was, I think, eight, maybe eight years ago. And that show moved to the Museum of Northwest Art at BIMA right here. Um, I've had multiple um, shows that I've been in. The show, what was it called? First Light? Yes, I believe so. That was the artist that they were planning on doing something with. And then two um, solo shows after that. If any of you have seen some of the shows that were there and remember the jellyfish mobiles in the front window with all the lighting and the sound, that, that was my work there. And then I had the entire upper floor that was a lot of, it was new work and work that the museum gathered from collectors and, and they were just wonderful to work with. Um, I'm in some, a lot of private collections and, and two of them that I think are fun is Melinda Gates, it was Bill Gates, he passed. Um, and Neil Young. So let's see, that ends the notes. Let's, um, I know there's gonna be a question period, but I'd like to just talk a little bit about this particular body of work. Um, I have a fascination with the macrocosm and the way forms translate from things that we can't see to everything else in the natural world. I guess it's maybe, a, the fact that uh, all of our DNA and all the DNA of life on the planet is all connected. You find forms that are contiguous constantly, whether they're in the microcosm or whether they're, uh, you know, a full grown available to our eyesight creature. And somebody gave me a small microscope some 15 years ago and immediately I was starting to do pretty well then with sales. I bought a, a quite an expensive microscope. Uh, I talked to a couple of my scientist friends that I've had, you know, and said, which microscope should I get? I don't want to do, I don't need to look at viruses. I want to look at seeds and, and fungi and, you know, things along that line. And he told me and purchased this microscope. And that kind of started the seed series about 15 years ago. Um, and I, I thought, you know, m most seeds are beautiful. Some are iconic. So what type of seeds do I want to... And I always think about this when I'm portraying the natural world. My work is varied, very varied. If you look at my website, EisenhowerSculpture.com or Eisenhower Sculpture on Instagram, you'll, you'll see. Some of it is dark and a lot of it is beautiful because I think we need both, we need that dichotomy now to realize kind of where we're at, 
you know, the human race. So I also talk about climate change and things along that line. But this particular series is about our relationship with plants and seeds. And in particular, there are some seeds in this show, such as these ones just off to my left here, and there'll be some photographs added in, that are called the, the, the nickname for them is lovegrass. The actual name is teff, T-E-F-F. -E -F. They're an Ethiopian grain, and they were grown many thousands of years ago at the time when um, civilization was really just starting to form and concentrate into places where they needed to grow a lot of food close to it. And so teff was one of those iconic grains that helped civilization grow. As well as another one here called mother grain, which is the nickname for it, quinoa. And it's a tiny little grain that probably many of you may have eaten. Both of those are very complete proteins. Quinoa was the Incas that uh, cultivated that, and we know how big their civilization was. And other seeds that I have here are also just really interesting forms, like these ones behind me here. These are uh, mentha, which is the Latin name for mint seeds. They're just the common mint. I like to do these series pieces, and they're, they're a low edition. They're all like 20. Um, I like to do them sometimes in multiple types of patinas, and I never try to match the patina exactly. It's an addition piece, and I want there to be a uniqueness to each piece. So that seed um, just has this really interesting undersea sponge creature kind of shape also, and I really just love the, the look of it. This one here, called I named Starpod, because it looks like some kind of a spaceship. It's actually, or a boat. Um, I like forms that are evocative of any different things. Um, it is star anise, uh, which is a very common kind of Pan-Asian food, uh, herb, or uh, seed rather, used in that type of um, culinary arts. And it's just a beautiful boat-like form. Um, some of the other seeds that I have here in this show are Sangiovese, which is a medium-sized piece back over in this direction. And Sangiovese is one of the oldest grape seeds that we grew for wine. The Romans grew Sangiovese. Um, Blood of Christ, I believe the name translates into. I am friends with uh, some very famous horticulturists, um, and they have a famous Himalayan blue poppy that they gave me a seed of, and that's what these, this oversized, this huge poppy seed is, called, you know, a bit tongue-in-cheek, heroic poppy. Um, and let's see, what else have we got? We have one of the most common bean shapes, taken from the navy bean, and then just a beautiful abstract patina on it, but the shape itself is something that pretty much everybody can just recognize. Even though it's way out of scale, it's another one of those things you just look at and you say, bean, just automatically. And of course, beans are responsible for the protein for most of the planet, basically. So let's see what else we have. I'm just going to spin around. So, ah, in the back here is Zulu daisy, which is a <coughs> really old African daisy. And the seed itself looks like a piece of African art. Um, I've had many people tell me that, which is really interesting, because um, when I looked at the seed, I kind of thought that too, having looked at a bunch of African small, what do they call it, fetish art, or the smaller pieces of art, and, and, and thought, yeah, this looks like it, and this is a very interesting shape, and I, I think I'll, I'll do this one. The piece, Endless Forms, um, is something that I thought would you know, a bit abstracted from the rest of the work, in that it's not a seed, it is actually an abstraction of forms. But that said, it does look like some kind of a seed pod with something emerging from it. And the statement, Endless, endless Forms, is uh, one of Darwin's quotes. And um, I might be paraphrasing a little bit, but I think I have it accurately. It's, Endless Forms, most beautiful, are and have been evolving. 
So that is an abstraction of a whole bunch of different forms, animal and plant forms, together. It's a long process in um, sculpting and having something cast in the lost wax process. My conceptualization sometimes starts with drawings. Oftentimes it is just looking at the subject matter or taking a concept and translating it into something small with clay and then I go directly to the scale that I want. Once I'm at the scale that I want, depending on whether it's going to be an addition piece or unique, um, I'll pick the material that I work in. I prefer to work in wax, actually, either way, but if it's going to be a, an addition piece, it can have an armature, such as this piece here, um, which is only an addition of three. But So that piece there, sans the base, the base is actually steel. All of the rest of the bronze sculpture was first, there was some rebar, reinforcement bar used in construction, shaped, welded together into the, uh, roughly the form. In some areas, plaster applied over top of that, and then wax finally over that to carve and get the exact shape and the textures. Now, uh, for textures, I use, uh, in, for sculpting, I use a lot of different tools, uh, some hot, some cold. Wax is wonderful because it can go anywhere from liquid state to rock hard if it's cold and anywhere in between. <coughs> and when it's softened properly, it can be imprinted. And these are an example of some of my imprint tools here. These are actually just a two-part clay called female clay that has been used by animators and artists for many, many years. And so I can make wheels and different shapes and <coughs> excuse me, sculpt into those the negative of what I want in the positive in the wax. So then I can imprint the surface with these tools and I can um, um, flash it with heat to change it slightly. So I have a whole bunch, I have hundreds of these tools because whenever I think about a texture, I'm like, well, how do I do that texture? And I also use things like screen and um, other just natural fibers and stuff like that that can be pressed in and removed. So once you have an original, then that goes, that original, or, <coughs> I know this might be hard to follow, and I always try to truncate it, but it's hard. <laughs> um, so you can either have a mold that a wax comes out of, or you can sculpt the original in wax. And that goes to the foundry, and they're going to make a secondary mold out of mostly silica. Uh, it's like a ceramic shell, kind of. It's dipped in colloidal silica, which is liquid silica, and then in super fine sand. And then it dries for like almost a day. And it goes through that in 12 stages until it gets to these really thick chunks of glass, basically, on the outside. Then <coughs> that whole thing is put <coughs> excuse me, into a blast furnace, an oven, a kiln, if you will, actually. And the wax is evacuated. It's melted out of it. While it is basically red hot, is removed, and there has been a way facilitated prior to it, the mold being made of silica, there's been a wax cup and some sprues and vents and stuff put on it that are also now all hollow in that shape. And while it is red hot, it comes out, it's set up, and the bronze is molten and it's poured into it. Um, after only about an hour, it's solidified, and it's also popping the shell off. Then those parts, those bronze parts, oftentimes they are parts that need to be welded back together, are sandblasted clean, and then the process of the metalwork starts. I do, at this point, what I do is I have the foundry send me cleanly sandblasted pieces. Then I weld them together with various tools, high-speed grinders, chisels, and so forth. I put any texture or detail or form back in that's missing, remove the weld, and then I do the patina. And the patina is a process 
that um, involves both chemicals and pigments. Um, quite a few of these pieces have a white acid etched pigment. That's what makes them look like maybe they're a piece of ceramic or something rather than bronze. Because I start with this um, acid solution that I've developed myself over the years. And there are several recipes out there for them and I've uh, taken those and made them so I get more acid which gives me more green when I rub the white off. So the white stays in the crevices and I rub it back and I can get some greens and then I can use a whole bunch of other different very simple base nitrate uh, chemical compositions of like uh, nitric acid and steel which creates ferric nitrate which is basically rust and cupric nitrate is basically copper. So the greens and the reds are achieved through those. There are several other things that are used like silver nitrate which is actually fine silver dissolved in nitric acid and uh, the piece over here called sarpod, that kind of a grayish piece there is a form of that. That's actually silver on the outside that's been allowed to oxidize a little bit. So that's kind of a short synopsis of how you get from A to B or A to Z. <laughs> yes. In that patina <laughs> process, is it pretty controllable for you or is it more kind of a controlled accident kind of thing? There's quite a bit of both. Um, and so one of the things that can happen is just um, uh, sulf sulfurated potash, which is the same thing that occurs in hot springs and turns your ring or jewelry dark, you know, gray or black. And I sometimes use that in the beginning to uh, just blacken the whole thing and then carefully rub back using many different kinds of tools and pads and sanding things to get the the shiny relieved areas that we want. That's very controllable. Um, things overall like cupric nitrate are controllable to a certain extent. You need to learn to know what it's going to look like after it's waxed, which is what happens to seal the thing. And it doesn't look quite like that when it's not waxed. So you have to have that in your collective unconscious, in your subconscious, whatever. You have to have that in your head. You have to know what that's going to look like. And cupric and many of these chemicals are very, very touchy. Just a moment too hot or applied too cold and you'll have to start over again because it'll be difficult to erase that. What happens? It'll, it'll darken, it'll burn, and it can be very hard to control. And then things when you're applying really hot chemicals, um, and going for an abstract form, they're happy accidents that you kind of sort of understand what's going to happen when you splash the chemical on there and you, you sometimes make mistakes and, and start over and sometimes you get the beautiful happy accidents and more often you get those the more you do it. Like the bean that's over there that has a very abstract patina on it, depending on the patina. Um, all patinas will change if the piece is outside and there's not some care given to it. Some very slowly. Um, a straight cupric patina, if it's not applied with the right base that oxidizes, can, turn, can flash to some reds here and there, actually. Um, part of the oxidation process of copper. Um, but if it's done properly, all it's going to need is an occasional cleaning. And if it starts to look like um, it's developing more greens than there was there normally, uh, application of floor wax on it, basically, um, with a brush and then kind of buffed back. Some patinas just simply aren't meant to be outside. Um, like, uh, for instance, any of the white patinas because they're, um, they're more delicate and that white pigment in sunlight especially will deteriorate. Just like with a painting, you don't want to put a painting where sun is shining right on it all the time. You know? yep. So I, I do patinas that are both. When I know I, I, I'm doing a large scale piece, I mostly want those to be 
uh, a patina that can be outside, possibly. Now, both of those, though, um, are a really heavy application of cupric nitrate. And then there's a blue metal dye that's applied over top of them. And that gives a very kind of blue-green, especially this one. This one's really heavy. This one's more light. Um, and another example of that is see, uh, the stainless steel piece, actually, is simply stainless steel. I say simply, but stainless steel is a bugger, for another, any other word, to, to work with. It's like when you're grinding it, Bronze produces slivers that aren't that bad. You really, you know, as long as you have gloves on. Stainless steel produces slivers that just like, if you, if you accidentally put your hand down on the surface where they are, you've got 10 of them stuck in you. But anyways, the blue pigment is just put on that and wiped back, and that's a transparent pigment, pigment and the stainless is pretty highly polished, so that's why you get, somebody was saying to me it looks like it, you know, um, an aberration, like it's three-dimensional, it is three-dimensional, but like the surface is three-dimensional, shining through, and that's, that's because of the polish underneath. Yep. Paint is also used on bronze. Um, I only use pigments so far. I've thought about paint on a few pieces. Polychrome is, is the type of paint that's normally used on bronze. Right, the body of work that I have right now that's going to be shown at the Max Grover Gallery or at least some of it, um, that I've been really involved in in the last like year and a half. Well, actually, it's been going on three years now I've been doing these. They started with what I called holdfast, which are rocks that have seaweed forms on them, based on real seaweeds, um, that actually mount on the wall and the rocks can be suspended from the wall. The rocks are polished. I had to learn how to polish rocks. That was kind of fun except for in the wintertime because there's water involved and you're outside. I've really been wanting to go back into um, my lichen series, which I did for quite a few years, including some big pieces and wall-mounted pieces, because it's just so indicative of the Pacific Northwest. And it's also, they're just such amazing, I want to say creatures, because they're, they're, not, they're not a plant, they're not in the mushroom, they're just of their own kind of, they've been around for so many hundreds of millions of years and they're so fascinating and the structure from them and mushrooms also, just that whole group that is underground and that communicates with trees and things along that line is fascinating and the forms are otherworldly looking uh, when you look at them under a microscope, so I think that may very well be the next thing that I um, put under my microscope. What I have done, especially since about, oh, heck, it's almost been 20 years now that I've been doing unique pieces, because right away, as, you, know, I, I, you know, I liked mold making and I would make the molds myself, which is what you need to do to do an addition piece, but I also kept my additions really low, and I like just creating also just completely original work. So to do that, if the wax that I'm using isn't compatible or the foundry doesn't understand that wax completely, like how fast it burns out, the, I think it's called coefficient of expansion, how fast it expands, things along that line, then I can get flaws in the casting because I used the wrong wax. So what I did many years ago was just adopt the wax that the foundry that I'm casting at uses and learn to use that. And then I don't have to worry at all about any problems uh, in my castings from the wax that I'm using. It is a great wax though. And the foundry that I've been using for many years now, Trevor Hunter Bronze in Walla Walla, a smallish foundry that gives me perfect castings, that foundry uses two types of wax that they can mix. And it's a green and it's a red wax, which is nice, so you can tell by the color where it's going to be. One is very hard and one is very so fairly soft. So from that, I can kind of get any mixture, any consistency that I want, strength and malleability and so forth. One thing that's necessary in bronze castings is that, um, for the most part, they have to be hollow. Uh, you can cast up to an inch thick, but anything other than that, 
presents problems when it's cooling. The metal tends to move away from areas that are still warm into cooled areas, which creates a cheesy kind of effect in the metal, like holes and voids. <coughs> so you want to avoid that. And um, so most of that is hollow. So you have to have a way to get that shell out of the inside also. So it has to be cut into multiple pieces. So that was one. The tube form was two more. Each leaf on there uh, was a form, and was a casting, and that uh, pitcher plant-like shape is also a casting. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight weld joints to make disappear. How do you finish the welds such that they disappear? Um, there's a whole variety of tools used. Um, one thing that is extremely handy is high-speed die grinders with high carbide bits. So you have, you have earplugs, you have face shield and, and gloves, and these grinders that will just remove metal like really, really fast. Um, then there's these things called pencil grinders, which are just tiny little grinders about like what a dentist uses, you know, to drill your teeth, basically. They're 120 RPMs, and they, you can make and carve little texture with those. Then I make, um, and I learned many years ago, working in foundries actually, to take um, uh, high carbon steel. You can buy it in different shapes, and um, anneal it and grind it on the end to the shape that I want, and then case harden it, so that it's a punch or a hammer that I can stamp texture back into. And I, I have a, in my um, studio, I have magnets, big long magnets on the wall, and I have lots and lots of tools stuck on those. And then there's various types of sanding things uh, that go on, some go on grinders, some you use by hand, <coughs> things called cross pads, which are a cross pad basically of sand, sanding material. Things like fiber wheels, which are a wheel that has fi uh, s uh, sanding material carbide uh, embedded in it. Um, and my studio has a bench with a giant fan like right in front of it. And so, and I, I wear a mask and so everything just goes right out that, out there, except for the, you know, heavy stuff that falls on the floor. Oftentimes, um, Things that are complex, uh, particularly like these seaweed forms and stuff that are wall mounted. When I'm sculpting those, um, I have the, the found object that I'm using, which I'm, I'm using a lot of now. This next series has antique keys and locks and farm implements and stuff like that that a seaweed hold fast because they'll grab onto anything in the ocean that's on. And then the fronds of the seaweed come up and they lean against the wall in strategic places to make them look like they're just suspended. And they're held on with steel pins in wax. It's kind of impossible to transport that form to the foundry. So I have to chop it all up into sections that make sense where I can get to it to weld it back together. And then I individually pack those and send and I take photographic imagery and video of the piece. I put numbers on the back side where you can't see it of the fronds and stuff so I know where they go. I photograph the pieces, I print them out, I put those numbers on that so that because when I have like 10 pieces coming back and all these seaweed pieces, I learned from the first time I did that whole thing that you know, it took me like a month to figure it all out, but I slowly did. Um, so, yeah, oftentimes I, I cut them apart, but larger scale pieces oftentimes will just be taken to the foundry and they'll decide where they want to cut it apart. And I trust them. I've been working with them for many years and I trust that they're not going to, you know, create more pieces than is necessary. They're going to do the minimal amount of chopping up of the piece. I'm um, evolving a bit. I, um, there's a lot of work that I've been doing lately <coughs> that has kind of a surrealistic bent to it and um, 
And there's abstract narratives involved in it. Realism involved at the same time. Um, there is um, a uh, crankshaft, two crankshafts actually, large military crankshafts, which is the main part of an engine, that I have in my studio right now. One has what I fancy as a dinosaur foot. I looked at um, lots of uh, what we have available of dinosaur feet, and I sculpted one. And there's an eye beam that comes up in a, and then the crankshaft that's mounted on a kind of totem-like fashion, and then there's a big, the whole piece is about this tall, um, dinosaur foot sculpted very much in very detail. I also looked at, you know, lizard's feet and things along that line, and it's hollow on the top, and formerly stopped on the top, and when you look into the inside of it, uh, the piece is called Dinosaur, there's a mirror. So you see yourself. Um, and another piece that I'm working on right now with a crankshaft is, again, it has a totem-like shape to it, and it's going, and it's going to be completely covered <coughs> like it, it's some ancient totem in a jungle that's now grown over top of it. Um, I've done some pieces, like I did a polished columnar basalt <coughs> that has very log-like looking, like very nurse log looking, and it has what would be like a nurse tree on it. It's rather small, it's only about this big a piece, and it's broken off and blackened on the inside and burned out, and when you look down inside of it, there's a one small human skull. Um, another piece I did called Harvest, uh, is a seed pod that um, has a base that's like human fingers that come down, that have spikes coming up through them. And the seed pod opens up and it's empty except for a skull in the very center, which is also a rattle that you can take out and, and rattle. And that piece is called harvest. Um, so some of my work is moving in that direction. Some of it is um, talking about environmentalism uh, and, uh, from the point of like um, right now, like I was saying, this series about agriculture and, and, and um, <coughs> sea level rise through found objects and seaweed on it. Those are like beautiful, intriguing pieces that you cast wonderful shadows and that you can also find some kind of a, an uh, underlying narrative in it also. What I've been doing for quite a few years now is I've, the local schools, uh, some private schools, have been, uh, I've had some apprentices. So they come and they get credit, art credit. I have one right now and he has sculpted, this is one of the more talented ones I've had, um, his name is Severin Rust, which is a great art name, isn't it? <laughs> um, and he has um, created a kind of a figurative piece that's just the business suit with the arms cut off, and then there's the uh, old Victrola kind of thing coming out of where the head would be, and it's a small piece. And he's going to probably finish that up this Sunday, tomorrow, and then we'll send that off. I'll ship it off to the foundry, and he'll learn how to finish it off. <coughs> and in the interim, you know, when he's been learning to sculpt and all that, he's also been learning about the whole process. Um, and so he's been doing things like sandblasting stuff in the sandblasting cabinet prior to me doing the patina. And then he gets to watch me do the patina. As the old master sculptor Tom Jay that owned River Dog Foundry used to say, if you want to find the wisdom, you have to scrape some wax off the floor also. So I love having apprentices, and, um, and all of them have been a great experience. And from my previous one, I just got a really lovely note in the mail thanking me about how wonderful it was working with me and how he got great credit for it. And, so, and maybe someday, but I kind of feel like right now, um, I've got a lot of years of productivity, and, I, and um, my career seems to be doing well, and I just want to keep making things, mostly. 
Thank you, um, all of you. It's been a pleasure to work here with you. Thank you. Thanks. Please join us at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts to see new works by Christian Carlson and David Eisenhower on view from March 1st through March 31st.